Hello, everybody. This is the Essentials of New Jersey Real Estate. We're doing Chapter 3. We're going to be talking a lot about agency, a lot about how we're going to be working with buyers, sellers, landlords, tenants, agents, all that kind of things in Chapter 3. So there's a lot of stuff to take in here, um, and this is definitely one of the more important chapters, so I would definitely perk your ears up for um, my New Jersey candidates You know, for this chapter. This is a really good one. So let's talk about the general law of agency. So what is agency when we speak about this? And because we're not just speaking about it in regards to real estate, we're talking about the law of agency. So agency is when one agent, someone who is designated as an agent, represents or works on behalf of someone who is designated as a principal or client, okay? So when an agent represents or works on behalf of a principal or client. So we're going to talk about the different types of agency that we have, okay? And we're going to give examples of those and get into a little bit of detail. So the first one, and think of this as a funnel right now, because we're going to start at the widest scope, okay? And then we're going to go down to the most specific in regards to the scope of what that agent could do, in regards to what that um, that that person is responsible for on behalf of that principal or client. So the first one is universal agency. So universal agency happens typically, the best example of this is going to be power of attorney. When you represent someone and you have power of attorney for them, you could sign a car lease, you could make medical decisions, you could, uh, you know, sign, uh, you know, any other kind of documents for them. You have universality in regards to your agency relationship with that principal or client. So it's probably the broadest, most all-encompassing. It has again, if you were using the word in there, it has universality, okay, where it's going to cross over into many different aspects. Second type of agency is that of general agency. So we're going down, we're getting a little more specific. So general agency is the best, the best example of this is going to be property manager, okay? So if I'm a property manager, let's say I have an investor who has a property in Seattle and a property in New York. Let's say I am, because I love New York, let's say I am the New York property manager, okay? I'm going to have purview over that. And I'm probably going to have some sort of universality within that specific property, right? So I'm going to be able to hire a plumber if there's a plumbing issue. I'm going to be able to uh, you know, fix a, fill a vacancy if I need to. I'm going to be able to buy a vehicle if the, if the property needs a vehicle hire a contractor, all these different things are going to have somewhat universality in regards to my agency, my representation of the principal or client, but within the scope of what I'm supposed to be doing. I will have nothing to do with the Seattle property. I also couldn't buy their personal vehicle for them. I couldn't sign off on things like that. I couldn't help make them make medical decisions for them. So all those things I would not be involved in as a general agent. But again, I would have some universality within the scope of what I was uh, designated as the agent for. Okay. So the next one, most specific is going to be a special agent. Sometimes they refer to it as a specific agent. Um, I don't typically like to use that. I use special agent. Uh, and special agency, best example of that is going to be a uh, real estate agent. A real estate agent typically works as a special agent. Now, obviously, property management does fall into the real estate industry, right? So Special agency is where we typically fall when we are representing a landlord, tenant, buyer, or seller for that transaction, okay? So let me give you a perfect example. I list a property for a seller. I'm in charge of marketing the home, bringing buyers in. I am responsible for that. However, what happens is this. Let's say there's you know uh, a big snowfall and there's a, a two-foot hole in the roof. 
then what happens is this. If there's a two-foot hole in the roof and I notice it, I could call the seller up and say, hey, look, just want to let you know I was driving past the property. I wanted to put some new flyers in the house and there's a two-foot hole in the roof. And they'll go, oh my gosh, could you recommend someone who could maybe fix a hole in the roof? Now, you could recommend someone. You could do all that. That's being a great agent. Fantastic. Do that. It is not your responsibility because you're not a general agent, you're not a property manager to pick up the phone, call the contractor and schedule it and then set up payment, right? That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility would be to simply notify the uh, the client and say, hey, you have a, a 10 foot hole, a two foot hole in your roof and uh, we need to get that fixed, right? So that's going to be our three types of agency right there kind of spilled out for you, okay? Now, when we are working with someone in regards to uh, representing them as an agent, it is said that we owe them the fiduciary responsibilities. So this one is giving you the acronym COLD with an A shoved in the middle. And I actually like to move the A to the front of the wording and say that when you have a fiduciary relationship with someone, it is said that you have a cold, right? That relationship is closely knitted. So what happens is you could pass on disease to one another. It's a cold, okay? And let me tell you what they all are. So you owe them accounting. Now, I will tell you certain books will say accountability. Accountability is like care and obedience kind of rolled into one mushy thing, okay? Accounting has to do with it, and it is accounting. The A is always accounting. Why? And what does accounting mean? Accounting is, can you handle money? Can you do some basic math? Look, they're not looking for you to be a CPA, but they are looking for you to have some sort of semblance of being able to say, oh, my client gave me $2 and asked me to put it into the bank. I will be able to have the accounting skill to be able to deposit $2 into the bank. Like that, that, that is general you know, agency 101. You have to have some sort of accounting skills and accounting in regards to finances and general math, okay? And then you have care. You have to handle your client with care. You also have to be obedient as long as lawful, as long as lawful, okay? And we'll get into that with disclosures, okay? Because there's property disclosures and things like that that you need to uh, that that you need to go through in regards to uh, your clients because there's sometimes where they might say to you, "Oh no, 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 we don't need to, we don't need to talk about that." that no, 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 let's cover that up. And then you you would have to tell them, "No, no, no." I, I have no problem being obedient to you because I am your agent. Cool, not a problem. However, what you're asking me to do is not legal and it would be underhanded and we must disclose this, okay? And you also owe them loyalty, confidentiality. If they tell you something and they want you to keep it confident, okay, and it is not illegal to do so, then yes, you should keep it confident, okay? If the seller says, and this is a common one, seller says, hey, I'm willing to go down to uh, 500,000 on this home, but I'd really like to get 550. So could you make sure that you know we try to get 550 for it? And they might say something like, sure, not a problem. And then the agent goes behind their back and says to the other agent who's their buddy, hey, look, you know, seller really could go down to 500. So could you get me like maybe a little over 500 so that, you know, it can make my seller happy and, you know, all that. Here's the thing. If your seller doesn't know that that's how you're negotiating, here's the thing. If they know that that's how you're negotiating, you have not breached the the loyalty confidentiality. If you say to them, hey, I know you want to get a little more than 500. Is it okay if I tell them, if I try to kind of wiggle that around? And they say, sure, you know, I like your negotiating strategy, then that's fine. But if it's your buddy who's the other agent and you're telling him this just because it, it's your buddy, then you're actually breaching the uh, fiduciary responsibility that you have of loyalty to your client, okay? And also disclosure. Um, you know, we're going to get into disclosure in a little bit because it's it's actually really interesting 
to uh to see where how far we've come in regards to agency in the real estate industry so let's let me tell you a story and this story is something that i always love telling in this chapter and goes a little something like this so picture this uh, a, a couple comes into a real estate office now i know that that's not typical now but let's say we're back in the 70s right okay so in the 70s a, a family comes into a real estate office and they say hi I, i'd like to purchase a home in, in freehold new jersey for those of you who aren't in freehold new jersey that's a hometown of the boss mr bruce springsteen i uh, love freehold new jersey so the the couple who comes in the smiths they want to buy a home in freehold new jersey they come and they speak to the real estate agent and the real estate agent says you know what let me bring my my uh loan officer in here let me grab you a cup of coffee okay you get a cup of coffee uh a loan officer comes in and starts talking to him about finances all that fun wonderful stuff and then what happens is they start telling them what they could afford and what they could buy up to. And then they go back into the real estate agent's car. They find a home, love it, put in an offer. They sign on the triplicate carbon, press really hard, make sure it gets through the pink copy. And they buy a home, done, happy, and everything was wonderful. Now, we know a little bit about agency already because we've kind of discussed it. We've discussed fiduciary responsibilities. This couple... Okay, there was a government survey that was done like in the late 80s where they asked people similar to this where they said who that real estate agent that worked for you, who did they represent? Where did their fiduciary responsibilities lie? And it was really interesting because they all said, oh, that was my agent. They worked on behalf of me. And for the longest time, for the longest time, Buyer agency was not a thing. So actually, that agent that took him out, got him pre-qualified, was actually a sub-agent of the seller because the theory was, okay, that um, that you have, uh, that the seller pays the, the money. So because the seller pays the money, what happens is everyone is a sub-agent of the seller. So technically... Technically, that, that agent who worked for the buyers actually had the responsibility, okay, in legal agency to actually tell all that information about what the buyer could afford, all that stuff to the seller. So they had that legal responsibility to do that based on agency. Now, was that typically what was done? No, that wasn't. However, they did have that responsibility in regards to doing that if push came to shove, if it ever went to a court of law and it had to be adjudicated, right? So if you had to technically look at the law of agency, that's exactly what would happen in regards to that. Really interesting, really fascinating. But now in the late 80s, early 90s, buyer agency became a thing. So actually, buyers started getting fiduciary responsibilities owed to them right so they started to have fiduciary responsibilities owed to them which they didn't have before because again we were talking about how everyone was working as a sub agent of the seller right so this was a new thing for buyers okay and it's actually a really great thing um now in new jersey new jersey specific stuff right here we have a document called the consumer information statement it's also commonly commonly abbreviated the cis okay so your test you will see my new jersey candidates you will see the cis come up right so cis will be a common common thing okay now when it comes to uh the cis let me tell you what this is so it's going to outline how a broker intends to work with uh, a client in the state of New Jersey and also how they can work with a client in the state of New Jersey. Okay. So they'll outline those two things, how we can and how we intend to work with you. And now why is that important? And when do we have to give the consumer information statement to a client or a prospective client? And that's a great question. So we have to give the consumer information statement to buyers, sellers, before there's any substantial conversation of real estate, okay? Before there's any substantive uh, conversation at all. So basically what happens is this. In that scenario that I just gave you, we would have to have 
given that consumer information statement to that buyer, what within reason when they came into the office before they started telling us all the information about them, because they need to know what will happen with all that sensitive information that they give us and what you're obligated to do in regards to disclosing that information to any other parties in a transaction. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the different ways in which we could work with someone in the state of New Jersey. So the first two under the real estate agent can function as, okay, first one is really easy. There's the seller's agent or also a landlord's agent where the fiduciary responsibilities are owed to that individual, okay? And then the other parties are owed what's called fair and honest dealing. Now, I like to put an asterisk on honest because there's some times where you cannot honestly answer a question without breaching the duty of confidentiality, okay? Now, if it's a material uh, piece of information that needs to be disclosed, then you have to disclose that, right? Then I, I just told you there's certain things that you're going to have that you cannot keep the sanctity of confidentiality and still be able to uphold at, you know, a fair and honest dealing with the other parties. So you owe everyone else fair and honest dealing. So if you're working as a seller or landlord's agent, you would owe the other parties in the transaction what is said to be fair and honest dealing. Like I said, I always say honest with an asterisk, okay? Um, but your your test and everything will kind of use the term fair and honest. That's why I want to make sure that I dri drive that home as well, okay? Now, buyer's agent tenant's agent. Just flip it. It's the same thing. You know, we just went over it. It's the same deal. So just flip the parties and that's that. Now we're going to get into two of the more complicated um, types of age, types of ways that we could work with someone in the state of New Jersey. So in the state of New Jersey, we have dual disclosed agency, which is allowed. You can have dual disclosed agency okay so dual disclosed agency is i'm going to explain something to you before we get into dual dual disclosed agency so first and foremost the agency relationship is with the broker and the client okay so it's with the broker of record okay and the client you as an agent, okay, or a someone who works on behalf of the broker, you're working as a representative of the broker, okay? So you're not actually the one that has the fiduciary responsibility. So this is a trick question that you'll have. You ready? Um, and it happens all the time. People always get this confused. Um, trick question is this. A lot of times they'll ask you, they'll say, is the agency relationship dissolved if the agent dies? In the state of New Jersey, the agent is not the one who has the fiduciary responsibility. Okay, they're not the ones that have the agency relationship. They're a representative of the broker of record. So what happens is n no party in the actual agency relationship has passed away. Just the agent has. So when we're getting to dual disclosed agency, it happens when one of two scenarios comes up, okay? One of two scenarios comes up. The first is a buyer comes to a home that is listed by a listing agent. Let's say the listing agent's name is Bob, okay? Bob is representing the seller as a seller's agent and a dual disclosed agent if the opportunity arises. Buyer comes to the property and says, oh, I really like this, Bob. Could you help us purchase, put an offer in? Bob represents both the buyer and the seller. That's scenario one. Scenario two, Bob works for Stu's awesome, amazing real estate company. Stu is clearly the broker of record. Then Sally brings along a buyer. Now, this is a separate buyer's agent and a separate seller's agent, but they all work under Stu's Amazing, awesome real estate company. What will happen is this. That is also considered dual disclosed agency because the agency relationship is with the broker of records, Stu, and not with the individuals. They're just working as 
uh, representatives of Stu, right? So that's the situation there. So that is dual disclosed agency. Another two caveats with that is it must be consented to and it must be disclosed. You cannot have undisclosed and unconsented dual agency. That is illegal, okay? Last way which you could work with someone in the state of New Jersey is a transaction broker. So a transaction broker is someone who works for the deal and does not owe fiduciary responsibilities to either of the parties. However, he does owe them fair and honest dealing. There are certain business models that would be more prevalent to have dual, uh, excuse me, transaction brokerage as the type of agency that that uh, brokerage would participate in. So there's some that are just more, um, again, it's more of a business model thing than anything else. And I'm not going to really get into that right now online. So you do have to give the consumer information statement. Like I said, I, I mean, as soon as you have any type of interaction with them, because bottom line is this you can't have a situation in new jersey where that buyer that seller that landlord tenant does not know what you're going to do with that sensitive information they're about to divulge to you okay and what your obligations are what your legal fiduciary responsibilities are to anyone pre-existing them entering your life okay now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more about dual agency because, again, there's some things in regards to dual agency that you're going to have some of your fiduciary responsibilities compromised. And I want to make sure that you're aware of this. The fact that you have two parties that either you're representing both of them in one transaction, right? You're working as the agent for both, like the one where I gave you where it says Bob, and he represents both the buyer and seller. There's things that you won't be able to tell either of the parties. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. In the negotiation, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, the seller's willing to go down to this number, the buyer's willing to go up to this number, even though you have that information, right? Or you potentially don't, but it's something that, logically you would have that information at least right so what happens is you would want to make sure that you realize that that is definitely something that is compromised okay and it's something that i think that it's prudent that you also tell all the eight all the clients in that uh, relationship you know the the realities that of something like that happening where you you might not be able to give them full disclosure right because the fiduciary responsibility of uh disclosure is basically breached in regards to what you legally can and cannot tell them, right? Because you can't divulge information to leverage one side over another, okay? Can't do that. Now, we're also going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about right now, um, I think dual agency, we've kind of, we kind of covered all these slides right here. So I'm going to skip over this and I really want to get to the material information in regards to defects in a home, stigmas, things of that nature. So let's talk a little bit about murders, deaths in a home, stuff like that. Do we need to disclose that in New Jersey? If I was in front of a classroom right now, I would say, hey, uh, do you need to disclose in the state of New Jersey the uh, death, a murder in the house, stuff like that? The answer to that is no, you don't need to disclose a death, a murder, and anything in the state of New Jersey, stigma, anything like that, okay? However, you do have to disclose latent defects and material information, okay, in regards to the physical condition. So if there's a problem, if things have changed in a home, things of that nature, you need to do that. There was actually a famous case in New Jersey where there were, uh, unfortunately, two young girls who died in an elevator shaft in a home. And those young girls, uh, it was a horrible, horrible accident with an elevator shaft in a residential home. And buyer came along, purchased the property, okay? Now, the elevator shaft had been removed, okay? And I, I don't recall exactly the details if there was a defect or if there was a 
manual error with something, but I believe there was some sort of potential defect and they had the elevator removed. And what happened was they didn't disclose, the seller didn't disclose the deaths and they didn't disclose the removal of the elevator, okay? Um, and that would be something that could be labeled as a latent defect, okay? Now, the buyer came along, purchased the property, found out later on about the deaths and said, hey, we're going to sue because <laughs> no one told us about this, okay? And... The debts were connected to the uh, latent defect. And what happened was they won on the basis of the fact that the latent defect, the fact that the elevator was removed, was not made uh, made made known. Okay, so it wasn't disclosed about that situation. The deaths were secondary to it. They could have disclosed the deaths or not. That's the reason why they found the latent defect or removed the elevator shaft. So you really do have to disclose material information in regards to condition, in regards to, uh, you know, the uh, any kind of latent defects that can't be discoverable by like an ordinary inspection, things of that, that nature. The other thing that we need to talk about in regards to disclosure is Megan's Law, sex offenders. So when it comes to registered sex offenders in a certain zip code, you cannot disclose the presence of registered sex offenders to a potential buyer if they do not live within that zip code. Now, there are online resources, there are things that you could do, but nothing is as accurate as police records and going to the police station and getting the most up-to-date information. There's a couple of reasons for this. And I know probably some of you are like, ah, that's crazy. I should be able to, if I'm going to be moving to Friel, New Jersey, because Stu just mentioned it, and it's a hometown of the boss, and they have delicious ice cream over at Jersey Freeze. And I want to know where the sex offenders are. Problem is this. You, you can't know the presence of that, and that's to protect the people in the town. Megan's Law was designed to uh, protect individuals within a town to know the presence of any registered sex offenders so that they could protect their families. It was not meant to detriment them in a way that would eventually, um, you know, impact their home prices and things like that, because sex offenders do have a transient nature. Usually they don't put roots down and, you know, establish themselves within the community. So they usually do move from town to town. So what happens is a sex offender may be there one day when you're selling your home and might leave in three to four months. Okay. So what happens is Megan's Law is designed to protect the individuals within the town, okay, and allow them to protect their family, but is not meant to detriment them as to allow others to make decisions based on a potential transient sex offender being in an area. So if you do happen to live in an area or have information in regards to sex offenders in the area, if that person does not live in that zip code, you cannot disclose that. The last thing that we want to talk about is price fixing and antitrust. So it's often referred to the Sherman antitrust. Every commission is negotiable. Every commission is negotiable. There is no standard commission. So if two agents were talking about a perceived standard commission or talking about business models or talking about anything like that, okay, it could potentially be perceived as price fixing. So it's something that, especially nowadays with uh, social media, you really do have to be um, very cognizant of this. This is something that I think that we, we don't say it enough, but you really do need to be very, very aware of the fact that uh, price fixing or the perception that there could be underlying price fixing or the suggestion that there's a market standard for commissions is certainly illegal. It is something that is taken very seriously and could end you in a lot of trouble. There will be there will be examples on the test where they will say there are two brokers in a coffee shop and they're discussing commissions. Is that legal and why is it not? Sherman antitrust or antitrust or fair trade? Those are the buzzwords that you want to see. Okay, fair trade, antitrust, Sherman antitrust. And if it's any one of those, it's probably going to be the answer, okay? And I, I say probably, but read all the answers. Read all the answers and thoroughly read the question. But guys, that's it. Chapter three. Have a good one.